Right, let's move on because um, time for us to turn our attention to hurling. I'm delighted to say Jamie Wall is with us this morning. Jamie, good morning to you. How are you? Well, Joe, how are you? Yeah, good. Owen is getting us all excited about the fact that we're a month away from one of the best sporting weekends of the year, which also involves a fairly seismic monster hurling clash. This weekend, we get to watch a preview of it. How relevant is it? How important is it? How, like, how could it not be relevant, given how close it is? Uh, it's very relevant, but how, how important it is is probably a better question. Uh, I would probably say that it's um, it's going to be interesting in terms of how they deal with it, but not necessarily uh, that like important in terms of... I don't know if we'll be able to come away drawing too many conclusions from what has gone on on the pitch, if that makes sense. A little bit. Now, regular regular viewers will know, uh, particularly Owen, will know how obsessed I am with this kind of bit where you you have the opportunity to kill your opponent. You you don't go, oh, look, I'm going to let you find a little bit of rhythm here and get a bit of confidence. And I think if you're if you're in a winning position, you should go out and and win, particularly against an opponent you're about to face again. Yeah, I think, and funny enough, when you're talking about that killing uh, side of things, I actually watched the Tiger Woods documentary last night and that was something that kind of really came through. Uh, I watched both parts um, and it was something that really kind of came through. I think what you're saying is very relevant if you're talking from a Limerick perspective, but less so from a Cork perspective. And I suppose the reason I think that, and this isn't just uh, the kind of bit of Kerry blood in me and I'm yarring and yodeling away all morning, <laughs> but I do think the most, I think that's more relevant from a Limerick perspective in that they are in a winning habit. And I know not necessarily in the immediate term, but in the sense that they're the dominant team. They're the tiger, if you will. They're the one that, you know, have been winning, at winning in the big games. And I suppose for them, it's a case of if they can put their foot, do foot down on Cork's throat and say, no, that little bit of momentum you got, that's just the league. Shut up and get back in your box. Then great. From Cork's perspective, I don't know if there's a whole lot to be gained from showing your hand too much obviously you need to you need to kind of stick with the processes that you put in place to an extent and try these things out and i'm not saying you go full q tour and kind of play a dummy team totally but by the same token i think it's one thing people seeing your games and analyzing them but it's another thing giving someone a f complete feel for it in the flesh um so i suppose i definitely understand where you're coming from and i think that makes sense when you look at you know the big consistent winners like Kilkenny back in the day, li what Limerick are trying to become now, um, that element of we're just going to become untouchable makes sense. But I suppose if you're the contender and you're Cork, we'll say, for example, which is what Cork are for going into this game, let's make no bones about it, um, then I think it's you're probably, you probably have to come at both from a slightly different perspective would be, would be the way I look at it. We had Taggy Fogarty on Friday night and he was saying that uh, they they had an aura right when they were in their pomp and um, as they started to lose games the aura slipped a little bit and he was just making the point that Limerick kind of need a win at the moment just to make sure that aura is still there that's my that's my contention here is that for for Cork to get out and win this game this weekend would be like you have the chance it's not it's not going to be a crisis from Limerick's perspective because obviously it's only the league and they can fix it right but it might be a little bit of a crisis there's certainly doubt in their minds you don't know that well you know like in, inject a little virus into the system and see what happens create the chaos uh, i i i don't know i think I you're, think you're playing year, those cards close to the chest from cork's perspective no, it's it's not that at all no it's not that i think any other year you might have a you might have a point but i think this year it's very easy for you know people who are good psychologically which limerick are and they have a good setup there it's very easy for you to, I suppose, you know, to move these points on and, and not really get too bogged down in the results side of it. I think okay. coming coming into the league this year, I would have classed it as the least important national league, hurling wise, by the way. I would have classed it as the least important national league in terms of really? the results. And I would have thought the only thing that really mattered here was getting your players through it without injuries, without picking up injuries, getting game time for this championship and and um, kind of if you're a team like Cork developing your style of play if you're a team like Limerick just honing it maybe getting one or two additions okay. so look any other like I, I, I don't know I, I hate to be raining down on this on this brainstorm that you have and I do I understand where Taggy was coming from in terms of you know aura and that I suppose but they were doing that for 10 years and, and it was a hugely competitive national league and 
I want you to remember is that was that was happening over the course of seven, eight month season. Like this is very much these games, like the first two games of the National League were challenge games and like played out in front of empty stadiums to boot. Like let's let's not kind of let's not lose sight of that. You know, I don't think I, I would say any other year there might be merit to that. And there is a small degree of merit to it, but I, I wouldn't be overly panicked about it um if I was Limerick if from a Limerick perspective and you know, like they're they're going to win their last game before they go into the championship, regardless. Like so, um, I kind of I would say if they can come out of the whole thing having blooded a few players and being kind of championship ready, I don't think they're going to be overly worried. It definitely is the, the least important league we've ever seen in terms of the league title itself. Like I mean, and not even having league finals, for example, in football, I think completely just destroys the whole relevance of the competition. However, as you say, these are challenge games and teams behind closed doors in previous years will have tried stuff in challenge games that they will be bringing to the table in championships. So maybe people are looking at it from that perspective as well, Jamie, that it's like, what can we actually learn rather than reading into the results too much? So what have you seen from the cards that Cork haven't kept too close to their chest over the last little while? Definitely. Well, listen, the first thing that is very plain is uh, the support play kind of game that they're looking at. And um, a little bit of a throwback to that kind of running game that, you know, we'll say they pioneered under Donald O'Grady, and I don't think it's any coincidence that Donald O'Grady has gone in. Um, I think that's been well documented anyway, so I don't need to labour that point. But, um, you know, look, like I said, games are behind closed doors, so you're getting to see them on telly rather than in the stadium. And it's quite hard to, to really see exactly what's happening when you're on telly. But I was fortunate enough I got to go to the to the Waterford Cork game with TG Carr and that, and... One thing that was very, very clear was the running off the ball that was going on. And um, probably one of Cork's first first puck outs, Damien Callan, and he was doing it for the entire game, was he was taking the ball almost on that half turn. He was half turned out. He was half looking at Patrick Collins, and it was going straight to him. He was going out giving the pass. But what was most interesting was, even though he's full back, and I think full backs of yesteryear would be getting cold sweats when they think of it like, he was just continuing on his run. He was far more like a footballer, which I suppose he is. Um, he's far more like a footballer than, than a hurler in that sense in terms of his run. And I think Dara Fitzgibbon got a score off it. It was right before the water break. And if you actually watched it back, Kyle Ann was actually going past him on the 45. Um, and it made the water player hold off. And it was just after the water break then you saw Tim O'Mahony and Dara Fitzgibbon go beyond the ball again in that support run. And it, it ended up in a goal like two, three minutes later from a very similar play down the left-hand side. So um, that's definitely a card Cork haven't kept close to their chest. I suppose they didn't have a choice in terms of keeping it close to their chest. And they have to develop it. What I think is going to be most interesting from a Cork perspective is whether they can, um, you know, whether they can, I suppose, develop not so much a plan A or not so much a plan B, but a kind of a, a second plan A to run alongside this because... You know yourself, pardon the pun, you know yourself, you can't just keep running the ball in any sport. Like, you know, you look at other sports, look at American football. The point of a run game sometimes is to open things up for a passing game and vice versa, you know. And, and it's the same for Cork here. You, if you look at, like, you know, it's, we're talking about Cork and Limerick, you look at the best in the business is, is probably Limerick. Like, they like to play it short. They like to play it through the lines. But very often, Dermot Burns just launches one at the back stick to Aaron Galan, you know, um, when that space has been closed up. So um, I think for Cork now, I think maybe, you know, the thing they've kept, the thing that the card they have shown is their intentions to kind of run the ball and it's whether they can add a variety then in terms of a slightly more traditional aspect to their game. Um, you know, I suppose like having that variety going will, will would, would stand to them. So it'll be interesting to see if they can marry the two. Henry Shefflin was out doing media yesterday and was talking about the worries he has for hurling as a sport and says maybe there's less goals, more long range points. Cork are railing against that. Cork are saving hurling at the moment, Jamie, with their goal-scoring exploits. Is that a natural extension from the running game? Is that why they're scoring so many goals? Definitely, yeah. Like it's like you said, if guys are running off the shoulder and if the space is there, then you're going to create overlaps. And if you create overlaps, you're going to create goals. Um, like that, that shouldn't be. Uh, that's not revolutionary. I'm certainly not uh, the smartest guy in the room by by putting that uh, together. Um, I I wouldn't. I wouldn't get too bogged down in the whole thing. I think the Limerick game is going to be a nice little test of that because they are one of the teams that are, are best set up to not concede goals. Um, look, I think the game against Westmead is an aberration. Um, I think, unfortunately for Westmead, they got drawn into kind of a bit of a, a lion's den there with that group. And, 
you know, with the exception, like when you look at the two groups, they, they got kind of, they got all the All-Ireland contenders uh, with the exception of Kilkenny um, are in that group together with them. You know, you have the last three All-Ireland winners in the last four All-Irelands, um, sorry, in the last five All-Irelands are, are all in that group as well, you know. Um, Kilkenny are the only All-Ireland finalists since 2013 not in their group so I think they got they kind of got a short, short straw there in that they got no chance to develop you know if you look at the other if you look at the other group Antrim you know they, they were fine and competitive uh, against Kilkenny they beat Clare uh, you look at Leash they're, they're never getting blown away too badly in those games because they're kind of there's a small bit of a, a step in there and um, so look I wouldn't read too much into the seven goals against West Mead um, and I suppose the only reason I've qualified that is I just I don't want to be I don't want to be uh, Slate and Westmead or anything I don't think it's their fault but there is just it, it takes it takes a couple of games to get up to that level and um, the five goals against Waterford was definitely uh, something that you could you could look at the way the Cork were playing because you know the two things Cork's goals mainly came from that they were turnover Oh you've just gone mute there Jamie Honest we've lost your we've lost the audio to you there Jamie I don't know if there's um, a call come in or a a message or something. We'll, we'll try and get your audio back there in one second. It's really interesting the influence that that backroom team is having and you know we've talked before about the um, uh, Travelling Wilburys aspect of the supergroup. <laughs> uh, I don't, uh, you, you got a good laugh out of uh, Cyril Farrell when you uh, used that uh, cultural reference. Did you know what it was? No. Really you didn't? The travel. Sorry, I'll do a quick Google here, and uh, I'll, I'll engage in conversation with about the travelling. It's a supergroup, right? It's uh, the whole notion of a supergroup coming together. Oh, it's. Uh, oh, the. Uh, I see. Sorry. Yeah, I thought it was a TV show. I thought it was. A, it's the. Ah, uh, okay, right. So, so who's who's Tom Petty in this? Who's Bob Dylan in in this? Hey, names you recognise? Assuming, uh, who is. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to name off any other names because the Wikipedia thing doesn't go that far. Roy Orbison. Roy Orbison's in it, right. 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 What, a, what a super group, Jeannie Mac. Right. Don't look where he's Roy Orbison. No, the, Karen Kingston's Roy Orbison. He puts the band together. Okay, right. This is an education. The, right. the, the Avengers basically would have been a better cultured reference. Well, uh, I'm not sure Sarah Farrell would have got it. Jamie Wall, you're back with us. Here you. <laughs> we were talking about the influence, <laughs> the influence of the backroom team. And uh, I, look... I cut. I caught, I, I caught the bit about Roy Orbison. I was a small bit unsure what was going on there. <laughs> so was I, Jamie. <laughs> you, have, you, have you heard of the Travelling Wilburys? Uh, no. Oh, right. That's, uh, <laughs> before, that's, before, that's before my time. For God's sake, Ger, like, I mean, you're just completely alienating the youth of society. Well, <laughs> oh, and explain there my was, point. There was, there was a nightclub in town called Wilburys before, but again, that was before my time, time as well. So. <laughs> Jer's basically making the point that he, uh, Cork have gone all Avengers Assemble on their coaching st on their coaching staff, basically, and have got all the great minds together, and they are going to to destroy everybody with this collection of, of brilliance. Yeah, well, it's a good mark of management, in fairness, here in Kingston. Um, I think, you know, isn't it that saying that, like, when you're the manager, the job is to not be the smartest person in the room. And I think uh, I think he's done a very good job of getting, you know, he's kind of got Donal O'Grady and knowing that we're all going to be here talking about Donal, Donal O'Grady instead of Kieran Kingston. And uh, I think when you've got a manager who's willing to do that, that's that's a huge that's a huge sign. And that's probably a strong part of why Cork are progressing. But you've also got uh, Christy O'Connor there. And I think, you know, Christy O'Connor is going to be very important for Cork this year, especially as a former goalkeeper. Um, he's written a lot of good pieces in in the Echo and Cork in terms of and spoken about puck out retention and stuff like that. Um, and I think that's very important. Number one in terms of you know um, the way the game is going with puck outs, but number two in terms of you know Cork are trying to bed in a new goalie this year um, with Patrick Collins. Obviously, he's been in the panel for a couple of years, but uh, it's a different thing being number one. So um, you know, I think like just those two examples alone before we even get into the rest shows um, that Cork have put together a very strong management team. The one thing, and I'm just like, th stick with this for a sec, right? Cork hurling fans must be the most brutalised group of sports fans in Irish life, simply by virtue of the fact that as long as I was alive, they were the most confident and self-sure and rightfully so because of the quality of, of uh, hurling that they had been raised on. And yet, they are now officially in one of the longest famines in Irish sports history for a superpower. So, do you allow yourself, 
little moments of idle dreaming about what might be possible this year? Or are you all, as a, as a race, so brutalised that you don't know what it feels like to be hopeful again? Um, I don't know about that. I don't think, I don't think uh, you could ever say that car curling people are... Uh, are so brutalised that they um, that they are not capable of dreaming about winning the All Ireland. I think someone said that there was Cork people talking about winning the All Ireland after we beat Wex after we beat Watford. Like so, um, I don't think uh, I don't think that's something we're lacking. I don't think we're um, I don't think we're going to be short of people with idle dreaming. I, I'm pretty convinced there are people in Cork who who reckon we're going to win the All Ireland this year. Um, I at the start of every year, that's kind of one of the the beauties for Cork people is that they they do wake up at the start of the year thinking, okay, we're going to win the All Ireland this year, even when it's absolutely, even when it's absolutely preposterous to say so. I don't think they're as far away. By the way, um, I don't think they're as far away as maybe some people think. But equally, I don't think it's this year. Um, but if this year could be the start of of a kind of two three year process, I do think there's a, there's a very good chance for Cork to be successful. And I suppose part of the thinking for that is. I think we're we're two three years on now. I kind of always forget about the last year has just gone by because it just seems to nothing. It was kind of a nothing like, but we're two or three years gone by since Cork were in All Ireland under twenty one final. I know they lost to Tipperary, but I would say that they have probably more good players in that team than what Tipperary will get out of it. The following year, they were well beaten by a better Tipperary team in a twenties final. But I suppose the point I'm getting at is, you will have a couple of twenty three, twenty four year olds in the next year or two. You know which are they're grown men there like and you have then got a very strong cohort of players you've UCC have won the last two Fitzgibbon Cups in a row um, largely backed by players from Cork so there's a strong enough group coming there um, um, and I would say that if they can use this year uh, as that sort of springboard I think there's a very good chance going forward but at the moment I can't speak for everyone else in Cork it's quite a large county um, <laughs> Go on. with uh, with quite a lot of people but I'm not I'm not idly dreaming that they're going to be uh, tasting all Ireland glory this year but I certainly don't think it's a million miles away either well that that's you got hope that's the main thing it, the, the hope hasn't been been beaten out and I think I'll, I think it, uh, some of it has to do with the fact that the Avengers have assembled and there's a, a pathway back to previous glory and a plan in place that's clearly visible to everybody. Definitely, yeah. It's funny, like that's that's probably the the big thing, you know, that that word plan. Like, and I think it's more important that they have a plan than it be a perfect plan, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, like at least if if everyone's going in the one direction, if it's not perfect, that's fine as long as they're going in that direction. And it's certainly something that's visible is that um, there is a, a kind of a, a direction to Cork's hurling at the moment. Um, I suppose, like I said at the top there, I hope that they can maybe add a bit of variety. I'm, I'm all for the support game, by the way. I'm not, I'm not going to be uh, grumbling on the ditch saying let it in or roaring or balling like that. You know, as you might hear from some more traditional people. But I do think a bit of variety will actually make the run game more effective for them. So, uh, I, I think, yeah, definitely. I think you know having that plan and that coherent thought to the way they play the game has, uh, has, has definitely helped Cork. Were, pe right. were people giving out about the short puck outs against Tip? Uh, oh yeah, Jesus yeah. Like they were giving out about the short puck outs against Waterford. Um, like they were like I think Cork scored two goals from it, but like they were still giving out about it. Like, uh, people there's kind of people tend to see what they want to see, especially with hurling. Um, you know, it's one of those things that if you give away a short puck out, people will go nuts over it, but they won't go nuts over you putting a hundred yard ball with. Uh, 100 yard ball with snow on it down on top of Dan Morris here someone and he just plucks it out of the sky and never get a score off it like um, they don't they don't actually see that as the direct kind of they don't see the direct cause and effect we'll say from that um, you know people just see long is far away from our goal that's good short is close to our goal that's bad um, and that's fine you know but I think uh, I wouldn't be getting too I wouldn't be too worried I think Cork short puck outs make sense I think again like I'm constantly speaking here now about variety and that like but I think sometimes um you have to go so far to a certain point to test things out and see what works and see what doesn't and there's always a kind of a learning point with it you know um you look at any other sport look at soccer teams playing out from the back people say like oh if they get it far away from the goal they won't concede but they don't see the scores that they get from playing out from the back you know or they don't see they don't see that oh if you boot it up the field and 
the other team get the ball for five minutes and you can see that at the end of that five minutes that has actually come from you just booting it when you could have passed it 10 yards to your right so it's about variety you know it's about sometimes not being afraid of a clearance but equally you know when you can play the ball out smart and when there is a short puck out there like if a team give you that short puck out and if you've got a plan on how to use it then why wouldn't you use it you know like Cork got Cork got more scores from sharp puck outs than they conceded from sharp puck outs certainly against Waterford uh, the game I was actually at you know I think you can see things a lot clearer there and you can see what's what you can see what's going on in front of you a lot clearer um, and I think that's probably something that you know when crowds come back I think it'll make more sense to more people when they can see what's actually happening in front of their eyes because you know when you're watching it on a television screen at best you can only ever see probably a third of the pitch you know you can't see what's happening 80 yards down the pitch and why a goalie is reluctant to poke it down on top of what might be happening down there yeah no, that all makes sense Jamie great stuff enjoy the game thanks a million no bother see you lads Jamie all giving us some thoughts there about Cork and Limerick at the weekend uh, I think it's going to be interesting it, the reason I asked that question about the um, the, the famine is because I, I still think one of the biggest what ifs in Irish sports history. There are a few, obviously. What if Roy Keane had played in Saipan or hadn't left uh, after Saipan? Um, but what would have happened, hurling, if the strikes hadn't happened? If there had been peace with the county board? If Donal O'Grady and John Allen had stayed on? Any combination of that as the Cork management team, and there had been peace within that camp, and they had come up against the greatest Kilkenny team of all time. What level of rivalry would we have got to? Because we'd already had three Ireland finals, we'd already had three years where uh, obviously Galway interrupted that, but um, where these teams were getting up to each other and the second spin of Kilkenny as it was driven on after that Galway game, what would that have been like coming up against the short puck out and Don Logue and that team? Yeah, it's really, like they were the one team who were really leading the way when it came to innovation in the game. Obviously, Kilkenny had a better bunch of players who just had talent all around the pitch. And, of course, they were very shrewd as well. A deeper, a deeper bunch. I don't know about better. I mean, certainly there were, there were more of them, but, like, that Cork team were absolutely sensational. They were a very talented bunch, but, but, like, the thing that you definitely think about is that they thought around games in a more advanced way than most other counties at that point. So how would that development have actually got to or what, to what stage would it have got in, in the, the late 2000s had, had things been a little bit more peaceful in, in the county? And also as well, how what would have happened to maybe some of the younger Cork teams coming through when it comes to that level of coaching and expertise that, that would have uh, dripped down through all the different parts of, of Cork? Like, they are the superpower in hurling. Like, it, it, there's no getting away from it. They're, they're not a superpower, they're the superpower until Dublin actually come along and uh, own hurling at some point down the line. Cork are still the superpower in, in the sport. And... The drought is way too long for a county of their size and of their importance. The 2010s, I think, the, the first decade without an All-Ireland. I want to say since the earliest, very early 20th century, since the first couple of decades, I want to say. I know somebody, that, that statistic's been thrown out there a lot. Imagine the scenes when they win one. It's going to be incredible, and it will happen eventually. It, 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 like, there, there's just too many good hur hurlers in Cork for it not to happen. Um, like... Jamie points out there that people were uh, maybe getting carried away a little bit after the Waterford results and thinking about the All-Ireland. I think that's just natural with Cork at the moment. I think no matter who you are, I don't think it's actually unique to Cork. I think if there's any team who, uh, like say, say for example at the start of this Premier League, at the start of the next Premier League season, if um, Manchester United win their first couple of games, everybody will be thinking Manchester United are going to win the Premier League. That's what comes with being a, for a team of heritage and a team that believe that they can do great things in sport. Uh, that's what Cork are, and they will. Like I, I'd be very surprised if we go another decade without Cork winning in All Ireland. It should happen in the next couple of years, and I think that there is more substance to the idea that they're dark horse this year. They've always been mentioned yeah. as a dark horse. No, you're right. You're right. You're, you're absolutely right. There's there's proper substance to it, and I think that we should see some this weekend.